Welcome, thanks for joining ACT for a webinar on heat pipe design and modeling. So today we're gonna to be talking about exactly that, modeling and designing with, the, with heat pipes. And this is actually a question we get very frequently from customers um, through our website. And people are just very interested in, now that I think heat pipes can potentially solve my problem, how do I kind of take it to the next step and um, figure out on my own whether or not it's gonna um, solve my problem. So today we're gonna go through some um, fairly basic steps on just to give a kind of first order approximation on whether heat pipes will work for you. And from there, um, we would always recommend contacting ACT and we can help you take it the next steps and create um, from concept to, to final product um, what a heat pipe solution might look for. So just a quick background on advanced cooling technologies. We were founded in 2003. Um, currently, we have over 200 employees and over 150,000 square feet. We have two office locations, one in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and one in York, Pennsylvania. And throughout our history, our core values have been innovation, um, teamwork, and customer care. So we like to work very closely with our, with our customers and partners on um, very detailed and challenging solutions with heat pipes and other um, thermal technologies to really solve some of the most um, challenging problems in the industry. And that does require a lot of the, those three core values, innovation, um, teamwork, and, and customer care. And just some awards that we've uh, been given over the, the past several years, um, Product Innovation Awards, the 2020 Military and Aerospace um, Product of the Year, which was um, pump two phase related, and then the AHR Green Building, which was a um, heat pipe or thermosiphon based solution um, for energy recovery applications. So jumping into the content here, um, the objectives of today's um, webinar is basically to provide an understanding of heat pipe operation. So give you kind of some background on the heat pipe theory and, and how it's gonna work in your system. And then really just dive into some of the, the design guidelines. So provide you with kind of those, those tools so you have them in your toolbox where you can design and, and properly say, yes, a heat pipe will work in my, in my given application. So from there, we'll jump into quickly the theory um, of heat pipes, some of the advantages, and then get into some of the, the examples on, on designing them. So very quickly, um, I know a lot of you joining are probably familiar with heat pipes. We'll give kind of a basic understanding of, of a heat pipe. And what it is, is a passive two-phase um, operating closed loop system. So how you utilize a heat pipe is anywhere where you may have conduction limitations in your system, so you can't spread the heat out um, significantly enough to meet your, your temperature requirements, or if you want to transfer heat from point to point, so moving heat from an isolated source or electronics component to a heat sink that might be downstream from, from your devices. So in those two um, operations, a heat pipe is a very nice way to to achieve that goal. And the way it works is um, at the heat input area or known in the heat pipe as an evaporator, you are boiling the fluid. So the heat goes in and you're vaporizing at that interface, creating a, a vapor that creates a pressure gradient within the heat pipe itself. And that pressure gradient forces the fluid all the way to wherever it's colder in your system. So in the example you see here in the top, it's pushing that heat from left to right and um, going into the condenser zone, which is where it'll give up its latent heat, condense back into a liquid, and will be captured within the wick structure. So the wick structure in a heat pipe lines the inside diameter, and it captures that fluid at the condenser, and then it creates a, a passive capillary force that pumps that fluid um, passively back from the condenser to the evaporator. So at the end of the day, you have no moving parts, um, a very, highly reliable system because it doesn't have any real failure mechanisms as long as you kind of operate within your, your boundary conditions and you get very efficient heat transfer. So um, because of the latent heat of vaporization, you have very high heat transfer coefficients at both those interfaces and you are able to achieve a very low temperature gradient, typically between like two and five degree temperature difference across um, end to end of the heat pipe. So the benefits for, for heat pipes, um, in many cases, the, the benefit is 
size, weight, power, and flexibility. So in the, in the size and weight, a lot of times the alternative option for a heat pipe solution is just simply adding more heat sink volume. So creating a more massive heat sink will give you um, some thermal performance benefits, but will also eventually hit a, a limitation as you can't spread the heat anymore. So it does have the ability to make a more compact heat sink because of the better heat spreading. Um, and then the larger benefit is, is typically the power. So in many cases you can, with the same size heat sink, increase the amount of power you can um, output, or you can increase the power and create more heat sink volume by better spreading and better heat transport in your system. And the flexibility at the end of the day is, is primarily what our customers come back to us for because heat pipes can be bent and routed into a lot of different geometries. Um, it is a very flexible technology for in instances where you might be retrofitting it into an existing design that just increased the power um, capabilities from one design to the next. It does have that ability to integrate into a lot of different geometries. And one of the biggest questions we get very early on in customers looking at heat pipes for the first time is the reliability. And <clears throat> the this is a, um, a very real question, but it, it's one that is, is typically mitigated fairly early on because a lot of times the boundary conditions, power requirements um, will, will dictate whether or not a heat pipe's a fit. And if you can operate within those um, operating conditions that are suitable for heat pipes, it should be a very long life um, operating device. So once you properly design it into your system, if you're maintaining the temperature and power limits um, within a heat pipe, it should be a very long life design. And the, these type of systems have been integrated to very harsh environment type applications, defense, aerospace, um, medical applications, things that have very stringent requirements and have kind of that, uh, that need for very long life and very highly reliable systems. And the, the final question is kind of when do we use heat pipes and what are the thermal performance expectations with heat pipes? And that's where we'll get into a lot of the design and modeling um, work. But as I mentioned earlier, the, the two primary um, areas where you would look to improve thermal performance with heat pipes is heat spreading, which is the example you're seeing here. So you can see in the, the plate to the left, you have um, three hotspots really, two in the top and one on the bottom, where you're not able to spread the heat out as, as quickly as you would want to, to keep those electronics operating safely. So in this example, those um, blue lines that you see on both sides of the, the plate are liquid cold rails. And the objective here would just be to conduct the heat out to those, those cold rails and maintain a safe operating temperature at your electronics. So while the aluminum plate wasn't able to do it with the thermal conductivity of aluminum, by integrating heat pipes in there, you can see you're able to kind of short circuit that path out to the liquid cold rail. So in the, in the bottom case, it was just a matter of putting enough heat pipes in there to move the full power. And in the top case, um, it was actually a very short thermal path. So it wasn't a very long um, path to conduct, but in this case, you had such a high heat flux that you were still getting hot spots there. So in this case, we, we routed the heat pipes in such a way that you created a long condenser area along the cold rail, and that was really able to drive down those temperatures as well. And just looking at some product examples, um, you can see several here, and um, there's many more on our website to give you some ideas of, of how heat pipes are used. But again, here we want to kind of show the um, flexibility in terms of applications. These have been integrated into a lot of very complex systems, and also the geometric flexibility. You can see heat pipes of, of different configurations there, bent, routed, um, some with many heat input zones, so it doesn't have to be heat input at one end and, and condensing at the other end. You can have multiple evaporator sections to pick up heat from multiple electronics, and you could also condense to, to multiple areas as well. The heat pipe, because it's operating in passive two-phase principles, it will find an equilibrium as long as you're not exceeding one of your, your power limitations. So again, a, just kind of a nice demonstration of some of the flexibility you can see in some of these designs. And that's where, again, ACT could really help out. If, if you bring us a problem, we can 
give you kind of a quick order of magnitude sense on, yes, this can be solved with a heat pipe or, or maybe it's not a great fit based on um, the power, the boundary conditions and some of the ge geometric limitations. So now we'll dive into designing with the heat pipes and that's, that's really kind of the, the basis of this webinar. So we'll talk about the power capacity, which is one of the, the major hurdles in designing with, with heat pipes. And then we'll also talk about the design guidelines and get into some modeling later on. So the power capabilities, um, there's a lot of, of published data on um, heat pipe limits and it's, it's one of the um, first things you need to consider when, when designing with heat pipes. And there's, there's really several limits that kind of bound the, the power capacity of heat pipes. Um, in many of the terrestrial applications, the real defining one is going to be the capillary limit. The capillary limit is, is basically the wick's ability to pump the fluid back from the condenser to the evaporator. And so it has to overcome all the pressure drops in the system. Um, one of the largest pressure drops would be the gravity head if it needs to pump against gravity, which in most applications um, where it's going into things that may be variable orientation or may have to operate in, in different configurations, it, it's a requirement. You have to operate in, in any type of orientation, so you need to overcome that gravity head when you do face with it. Um, the other option, if you do have flexibility on your orientation and you can orient the condenser above the, the evaporator, you could move significant amounts of heat in those type of applications. So um, those operate mainly on the entrainment limit, which is um, the ability for the, the vapor to kind of um, push up against the liquid shear, strength, shear force that's coming down, uh, an ability to overcome that. And <clears throat> So in those type of applications, you can move a significant amount of heat, but for the purpose of this today's webinar, we're gonna focus mainly on the capillary limit, and that's usually the driving factors in, in terrestrial type designs. So the limits here are a function of several different um, items, but primarily the ones listed here are what we're gonna focus on because they can be used to quickly kind of approximate the, the capillary limit, and we have some tools to help you out as you go through that process. So the main ones are diameter. Um, so the larger diameter you have, the more power you can move. The length of the heat pipe, again, how you have to overcome all the pressure <clears throat> um, forces in your system. So the, the longer you are, the, the more you have to overcome, and that can become a factor. Orientation, as I, as I discussed, and then the two driving ones are the fluid properties and the wick properties. So those are, fluid properties are, mainly defined by your fluid selection, and the wick properties are where a company like ACT can come in and help you out in terms of how fine of a pore radius and, and what type of permeability you might need to achieve your goals. So in very quick approximations, we do have a calculator online, um, and this is a really good initial source to help you size your heat pipe. And um, so I would recommend going on there and we'll, we'll go through an, an example of, of using that calculator later on. Um, but just to kind of keep going through the design progression here, um, some of the, the other considerations are how it's gonna integrate into your system, how you can bend it, how you can pick up heat of various components. So we did wanna give kind of some sense of what's possible here. And the first thing is the standard pipe sizes. So we can make a heat pipe out of pretty much any standard tubing that, that is available. Um, you can see some of the, the standard sizes there, um, three millimeter up to eight millimeter and an eighth of an inch up to half an inch is, is very typical in copper water type heat pipes. Um, we've gone much larger than that in certain um, ammonia based or liquid metal based heat pipes, but there's there's no real limitation, it's, it's mainly um, manufacturing considerations, but those are very standard sizes that, that we use on a routine basis. And then probably the more interesting thing here is the bending and, and flattening guidelines. So this is a lot of what our customers will come and ask us is how tight can we bend a heat pipe and, and how flat can we make it before we're really um, kind of straining the, the design points of a heat pipe. And the recommendation there is for bending, it's, it's three times the outside diameter. So that would be a center line bend radius. So if you're bending a heat pipe, um, like you see on the bottom right one, 
that centerline bend radius around that, that 90 degree leg you see there is about three times the outside diameter. And that's where you won't hurt your performance um, vastly. If you go much tighter, um, you have the per potential to limit your performance. You also have the potential to kind of crank the metal envelope um, and cause potential issues in the manufacturing and, and bending um, steps as well. So the, the guideline for bending is three times the outside diameter. For flattening, we typically re recommend two-thirds DOD. Again, that's where you still have significant vapor space to move um, decent power. The more you flatten, the more you will um, impact the performance capabilities. So instead of calculating your capillary limit, for instance, with the, the round diameter, you're actually going to a hydraulic diameter as you flatten the pipe. So you're limiting that vapor space and, and limiting your performance. But two thirds is a good kind of guideline to, to keep you moving significant amount of heat through your system. And then in terms of integration, there, there are several options, um, mechanical fit, um, like press fit type, type heat pipe integration. But in most cases, you want some type of bond there. So in many cases, we'll do epoxy, which is not as good of a thermal performer or mechanical properties as a solder, but still gives you kind of a lower cost and you don't need to um, nickel plate aluminum if you're integrating into aluminum as you would with solder. Uh, but in most cases, solder is the, the ideal choice, and most of our customers prefer a solder. It does give you that, that really nice mechanical and thermal interface, and after nickel plating, you can integrate into aluminum or, or many other base metals. And now we'll talk about modeling thermally. <clears throat> so in your thermal resistance models, there's a couple different resistances to consider here, and we'll, we'll talk um, at length about how, how to model the, the heat pipe in general and modeling, cutting some corners to model the system. But really you wanna look at these, these different areas. So um, the case to, to heat pipe evaporator, that's conduction through either your, your solder interface, your epoxy interface, or, or some type of um, thermal interface, like a gap pad. You have your, your heat pipe, which is, as I mentioned, that two to five degree delta T across the length of the heat pipe. And then you have your, um, from the point of the heat pipe to your fin structure, which is again, typically conduction or subtype of interface there. And then your rise above ambient um, going from your, your fins to the air. So all of those needs to be considered to properly design your system to meet your, your maximum case temperatures. Um, make sure you don't exceed your maximum case temperatures. But what we'll focus on here is, is really how to model the, the heat pipe and the conduction areas around the heat pipe. So one of the most easy ways to model a heat pipe is the, the basic conduction rod. And this actually gives you fairly good results um, and, and would be a high recommendation if you're looking for that first order approximation. So you can, <clears throat> you can basically try to trick your system into showing two phase performance with a single um, conduction element. And the way we recommend you do this is you start by inputting what would look like heat pipes in your system, and then you assign them a effective thermal conductivity of around 10,000 watts per meter K. And that effective thermal conductivity of a heat pipe is going to vary based on length. So if you can meet your, if you can operate as a heat pipe, um, the shorter the heat pipe is, the lower that thermal conductivity is because you have the same delta T across a shorter length than as if you were going longer distances. But what we would recommend is start with 10,000 watts per meter K, um, run your simulation, and then check your delta T from hottest to coldest point along your heat pipe, and then adjust that, that 10,000 watts per meter K until you get within that two to five degree temperature range. So if you wanna be conservative, maybe go to the, the five degree temperature difference. So for instance, if you have if you have a heat pipe that's showing, um, if you input the 10,000 watts per meter K and you're showing an eight degree temperature difference, go ahead and increase that, that effective thermal conductivity so you get that eight degrees down to the, the five degrees and that's kind of a good approximation of what might be achieved with the heat pipe. Um, and I will say the, the five degrees is fairly conservative so you can a lot of times beat that in your models but in, um, in a real world case where you're looking for some conservatism, that's a, that's a nice first order approach to modeling heat pipe. Um, the second, which is even um, more basic, is 
modeling the entire high K plate. So high K plate is, is ACT's term for high thermal conductivity plates, which is embedded copper water heat pipes into aluminum heat spreaders. And um, we can make high K plates out of most uh, geometries in, in um, aluminum surfaces. If you, can, if you can machine in, you have enough area to integrate a heat pipe, we can typically turn it into a high K plate. And we've done models in um, going around corners. So both um, two-dimensional and three-dimensional high K plates have been achieved. So there are, there are some design variability in terms of how we can integrate the heat pipes. But in most cases, if, if you have enough um, thickness to get the heat pipes in there, we can turn it into a high K plate. And this creates a really nice approach to uh, very easily model thermal per performance improvements. So in aluminum, um, 6061 is, is what most uh, designers use as their heat spreaders. That's a thermal conductivity of about 167 watts per meter K. So changing from aluminum to a, a high K plate will increase that, that thermal conductivity dramatically and in real world results, what we have seen is between 500 and 1200 watts per meter K. So when I say real world, I mean, we're not kind of tricking the, the system to put a heat pipe in the most favorable condition and put a heat, heat source at one end, heat sink at the other end. We're, we're looking at real world applications where you may have multiple components and multiple heat sinks and you're designing a, a heat pipe network to achieve um, the desired results or best case results. And then what we'll do is go back into our models after we've performed thermal performance testing, and we'll just increase the thermal conductivity until we match our performance testing. So it's it's a very fair comparison to say somewhere in that 500 to 1200 watts per meter K range is where you'll land. And again, that, that variability or that range is based on how much work the heat pipe is doing, so how long the heat pipe is, and how much benefit you're getting from the more or less short-circuited thermal path of the heat pipe. So um, <clears throat> we'll talk about some examples later on, but for, for one quick example that most of our customers are familiar with, a um, 6U conduction card, which is around um, like nine by six inches, that, that is typically in the six to 700 watts per meter K range. So could have components located um, various places along the surface, but we can usually achieve somewhere kind of in the middle of that range to give you a sense. So again, here to kind of make it easy on you, we're gonna suggest using a, a thermal conductivity of 600 watts per meter K. So again, if you have any real distance or, or um, X, Y direction to move heat um, and a localized hotspot, that's something that is usually very achievable and, and we've proven now with, with many types of these designs. And the next one, and I guess the most complex to model um, is the, what we call kind of the, the lumped approach where we um, more or less lump some of the resistances of getting the heat into the vapor space and then use a very isothermal vapor space along the, the inside of the heat pipe. And this gives you a, a nice, um, more real approximation because it does take into account thermal interface, the, the heat pipe wall, the wick structure, and, and some of those um, more granular resistances that you would experience in a real world system. Um, but it does take some of the detailed modeling as from those um, various resistances out of the equation. So you don't need to model two phase flow. You don't need to model um, very high heat fluxes at, at very small, um, wick structures and things like that. So it's a way to kind of get a little more detail, um, but <clears throat> provide a, a realistic um, and accurate prediction um, without kind of taking significant computational time to run these models. So um, with that model, we'll talk about in, in a little more detail as we go through. So this example is trying to transfer 25 watts against gravity at room temperature. So now we'll kind of run through all the steps of, of the lump model in, in one kind of straight shot to give you an idea of all the, the various components. So the first step is to go onto ACT's uh, website and find the heat pipe calculator under resources and basically input um, your, your guesswork at what the heat pipe geometry might, might look like. So in this case, um, we took the 25 watts there and we 
we had it in a system. You could see the, the geometry there. We, we kind of determined what the heat pipe, heat pipe might look like in, in its configuration based on the, the source and sink conditions. So we had a total length of uh, 3.1 inches, a one inch evaporator, which is the, the heat source zone, and a, um, a very small condenser, less than one inch on the condenser, which gave a 1.32 inch adiabatic zone. So with those inputs, and, and you can see the figure over here to the right, those inputs actually output this these curves of heat pipes, which is the capillary limit for various diameter heat pipes. And you can see the, the red numbers there are the only inputs required in our, in our calculator. And then you can use those curves to figure out exactly where you're gonna be operating and what performance you need. So in this case, we had an operational uh, range of <clears throat> a little under 20 degrees to about 100 degrees C. And so we need to operate a, a, across that entire um, curve. And so there we were showing that a, a four millimeter heat pipe is needed. So now you know the kind of the diameter of the heat pipe, you can go into your, your modeling approach. So now diving into an example here with the, the lump model um, method, this is where we're going to determine an effective conductivity of several <clears throat> Pass to get the, the heat into the heat pipe. Um, and then there again, um, we don't want to model each of these individually because they're going to be very thin. It's going to bog down your computational time. So what we are trying to do here is um, create a sum of all the resistances in there. So you can see the calculations there as you go through your resistors. You have a resistance through a solder. Um, so you, you approximate that based on the um, thickness, the, the length that you need to transfer heat through that solder and the effective um, or the actual thermal conductivity of that solder itself. So then you can approximate the resistance of, of that solder. Again, same thing for the copper wall. Um, the copper wall for a four millimeter pipe is, is 12 thou. And there you can use the, the copper thermal conductivity and output a resistance for that as well. And then the wick material and evaporate, evaporation and condensation areas, we give an approximation here of a, a very <clears throat> low thermal resistance in those areas. And lumping those together, we wanna to create a model that, again, you can calculate in, in realistic time to, to create that first order approximation. So we're recommending that you <clears throat> model them as um, 40,000, so that, that won't create too um, thin of a surface to allow you to, to model it. And basically to create that effect of conductivity, you take all those different areas and you output your effect of conductivity. And with those results, you get 26.7 watts um, meter K as your, as your effect of conductivity through that interface. So that's, again, getting the heat into the, the vapor space at, at the evaporator surface and getting it out of the vapor space on the condenser surface. So that's an approximation that can use as your lumped envelope material that can take into account the solder, the wall, and the wick structure. And then um, from there, we want to put a, a value in for the effect of thermal conductivity of the vapor space. And the vapor space is gonna be nearly isothermal um, because of the, the um, working properties of, of fluid vapor, it's gonna be very, very low thermal resistance across the vapor space. So the approximation we're, we're using here is Fourier's law um, and going across that length. I will say this is a fairly conservative approximation. So um, in most cases, you'll, you'll see even a lower delta T than this across the vapor space specifically. But as a nice approximation, you can use Fourier's law, which takes the, the power, the effective length, um, and the, the area in delta T. And <clears throat> again, we're putting in some, some values in there um, for delta T. We're, we're saying two degrees as your, your delta T, which again is very conservative, but should give a nice approximation of what the effect of conductivity. And that value is gonna be very high because again, there, it's very isothermal in that vapor space. So going from there, you have all the inputs to, to run your model. So what we did there, again, just to recap, is 
will a heat pipe transfer the required power? So that's your first thing. You can have a no go, no go on um, if a heat pipe can move the amount of heat and what size heat pipe you might, might need. Once you have the size of the heat pipe, you put it into your model, say, do I have enough thickness here? Can I manipulate it within my model to get the desired results? Um, and again, if there's any challenges there, let us know. ACT can certainly help out in, in some of the um, practical considerations for integrating heat pipes. And then from there, we determine the effective conductivity of the various um, inputs, so the summed model of getting the heat into and out of the heat pipe or uh, into and out of the vapor space, and then the vapor space itself, which is a, a very high effective thermal conductivity. And from there, you can input your, your heat loads into your um, CFD model or, or basic conduction model, and you can put your sink condition, so your ambient air temperature or just the heat transfer coefficient to simulate your um, heat sink. And from there, you can run your model and hopefully get the desired results you're looking for. And uh, just one example of, of where we went through the steps on a, a fairly small uh, conduction card, and, and this was actually a fairly good approximation for the inputs we used. Um, in this case, we, we had the actual um, hardware where we, we tested. So we put in the 25 watts at, at that um, interface, and we, we tested it and got the results of about 80.3 degree um, interface temperature there. And then we ran the model um, in, in both ways. So the more detailed model was, um, was fairly accurate. So it got us within, um, within a 1.2% error. And again, because some of the vapor space um, approximations were somewhat conservative, um, we were actually under predicting performance of the heat pipe solution there. And then looking at a model using the effective conductivity of 500 watts per meter K, Again, um, a little under predicting the performance there, um, which is, is why we typically say 600 watts per meter K. I think we use 500 watts per meter K in this model because um, the distances were a little shorter than, than a, a typical high K plate. But in general, no matter what, K, what you're using, you can get fairly close to the results. And if you're within you know, a couple degrees or within somewhat margin of error, that's when you call ACT and we can help kind of guide you through the steps in, in getting a very detailed and um, accurate model. So then you can say, do we want to go through the steps of prototyping, testing this, and, and going forward with the heat pipe solution? So again, just to wrap up, um, heat pipes are highly reliable and they can be effective components in the thermal design. Um, they are used in a lot of real-world applications for electronics, cooling, um, avionics type applications. So there's not really many environments which heat pipes have not successfully operated, but there are a lot of practical considerations in, in each environment. Um, so um, thermal performance is one of, of many considerations in those type of things, but if you have a functioning heat pipe operating within its ability, they are very reliable and long-lasting devices. They can be easily integrated into new and existing designs. So if you know early on that you're gonna have a thermal challenge that can be alleviated with advanced conduction or point-to-point um, -point heat transfer, um, going forward with the heat pipe solution off the bat is often a great approach. But there's many cases where maybe your component um, power goes up from one design to the next and you need to retrofit heat pipes into an existing system. That's also a really good um, opportunity to easily integrate them without going through major changes to your um, heat spreaders or heat sinks. Um, there are several ways to effectively model heat pipes. We talked about several today and um, there's even more complex ways out there. So again, hopefully this gives you some tools in the toolbox to give a first order approximation of how a heat pipe, heat pipe might perform for you. Um, and then the final is, is ACT, your trusted partner. We're here as needed, so if you run into challenge running any of the models or thinking about some of the practical considerations with heat pipes, give us a call. We have engineers on standby ready to kind of walk you through the process and, and help you out as you are thinking about heat pipes. Um, and the final slide here, just wanted to, to talk about ACT. Um, your success is our su success, so we do take um, our partnerships very seriously, and we have received a lot of very good feedback over the years. 
So again, reach out to us no matter where you are in the process and we'd be happy to work with you and see if a heat pipe solution is right for your design. Thank you all, appreciate your time and please give us a call. We look forward to working with you.